Doris Milner, Michelle Goose, and Lori Farmer first crossed paths when a summer camp counselor assigned them to share a tent on June 12, 1977. Little did they know that their names would become forever entwined with one of the most horrific murders in Oklahoma's history. In a peculiar turn of events, less than two months prior to the tragic incident, during counselor training at the camp, an unidentified individual infiltrated one of the tents, making off with the counselor's donuts and leaving behind an unsettling note. Our mission is to kill the three girls in tent number one. Initially dismissed as a jest, the words were casually discarded at the time. However, they would later prove to be an eerie foreshadowing of the impending tragedy. Girl Scouts Denise, age 10, and an honor student, preferred to go by her middle name. Initially, her friends had planned to accompany her to Camp Scott, but they had a change of heart at the last moment. Despite her own reservations, the young schoolgirl found herself heading to camp as her mother insisted on the trip. Lori, the youngest at eight years old in the Girl Scout camp, held the distinction of being the eldest among her parents' five children. Described as a lively and precocious, giggly girl, she brought an energetic and outgoing spirit to the camp. Michelle, a nine-year-old with a shy and modest demeanor, had a passion for cultivating flowers. Before departing for camp, she made a heartfelt request to her mother to tend to her beloved plants in her absence. Letters Home They reached the campsite on June 12, 1977, but the weather had been unfavorable since morning, with continuous rain throughout the day. After spending some time engaging with the children, the counselors at 7 p.m. assigned the girls the task of writing letters to their parents before retreating to their respective tents. In her letter, Lori expressed an overall positive sentiment about the camp, mentioning her new friends, Michelle Goose and Denise Milner, and the enjoyment she found in their company. Denise, however, conveyed a different mood, expressing her dislike for the camp and a strong desire to return home, citing the absence of her friends as a factor. Michelle, either not having written a letter or having one that didn't survive, left no documented sentiments. A murmur in the woods. As night fell, Denise, Michelle, and Lori occupied the last tent, the eighth tent, situated farthest from the counselor's tent. Supervised by two counselors, Carla Wilhite and D. Elder, the girls engaged in various activities on the first night of the camp shift. Despite the counselors' efforts to settle the girls down, with intermittent interventions to quiet them, an unsettling incident occurred in the middle of the night. Carla, in her role as a counselor for the first time at 18 years old, was awakened by an unusual sound emanating from the woods, a low, guttural combination of a growl, a groan, and a murmur. Though attributing it initially to a potential animal or bird, given her limited experience spending nights in the woods, Carla felt compelled to investigate the mysterious noise. Sounds in the Night Carla, clutching her flashlight, opted not to disturb Dee and quietly slipped outside, determined to trace the origin of the unsettling sound. Straining to pinpoint its location, she discerned that the noise was emanating from the opposite side of the children's tents. Despite feeling a tinge of fear, she pressed on, following the sound. After approximately 20 steps, a branch beneath her foot snapped with a crunch, abruptly silencing the eerie noise and sending shivers down Carla's spine. Sweeping her flashlight from side to side, she struggled to identify anything noteworthy amid the dense vegetation. Admitting later, Carla confessed that fear overcame her, preventing her from venturing further. She retraced her steps, only to hear the low murmur again as she neared the entrance to her tent, now resembling a wheeze. I didn't want anyone emerging from the woods, 
Carla recounted in a documentary. Whatever it was, I didn't want to engage with it. I was frightened. Looking back, I have regrets. I feel guilty that I didn't investigate further. What had she heard? Perhaps the final moments of one of the girl's lives. Was the perpetrator testing the counselor's vigilance or attempting to lure Carla out for a sinister purpose? Frightening Discoveries At 6 a.m., Carla awoke to her alarm clock and, before heading for a shower, decided to check on the tents of the girls under her care. As she approached the edge of the woods to await the dawn, a chilling sight met her eyes. The lifeless bodies of Lori, Michelle, and Denise lay at the fork of the trail. Filled with dread, Carla rushed to alert the camp nurse, recounting the tragic discovery. The nurse conducted an examination and delivered the devastating news the girls were deceased. Parents swiftly arrived to retrieve their children who had been left at the camp, taking them home. Meanwhile, law enforcement, including the sheriff, deputies, and the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, had already descended upon the scene to commence their inquiry. Investigation Recovered from Tent 8 as evidence was a single unidentified boot print sized 40. In close proximity to the victims, police discovered remnants of rope and duct tape, the latter containing a strand of hair, along with a red flashlight bearing a solitary fingerprint. Biological traces were detected on each of the girls, although DNA testing, while in its infancy at the time, prompted the collection of samples. Forensic experts analyzing the victim's injuries deduced that the assailant was either ambidextrous or, alternatively, there were two perpetrators involved. The use of multiple murder weapons, none of which were recovered, further suggested the involvement of two individuals. As the police initiated a thorough search of the area, they stumbled upon a small cave approximately a kilometer from the camp. Inside, they discovered a fragment of the same duct tape found on the girls, along with several black and white photographs featuring women. Notably, scrawled on the cave wall were the words, The killer was here, so long fools. Upon closer inspection, it was revealed that the black and white photos were taken at the wedding of a correctional officer's daughter in Oklahoma. The images had been taken and developed by Jean Leroy Hart, an inmate connected to the case. Suspect From that juncture, Hart emerged as the primary suspect in the Girl Scout murders. Despite once showcasing promise as an athlete, he veered onto a nefarious path during his early 20s. In 1966, he assaulted two girls, and intriguingly, the victims reported peculiar behavior on Hart's part, including unsettling growling noises. Could this align with the eerie sounds Carla had heard on the night of the murder? Compounding the suspicion, Jean had a history of engaging in a string of burglaries and was handed a staggering 308-year sentence in 1966. Undeterred, Hart managed to escape prison in 1973 by skillfully sawing through the bars on his cell window. Trial In July 1977, Oklahoma witnessed the commencement of its most extensive manhunt in state history. Ten months after the tragic murders of Denise, Michelle, and Lori, the prime suspect was apprehended. As a Cherokee Indian, Hart garnered substantial support from the local Native American community, who staunchly believed in his innocence. Fundraisers were organized to secure legal representation for him. During the trial, it became evident that the prosecution's case was inadequately presented and crucial pieces of evidence were effectively refuted. A shoe print near the girl's tent was three sizes smaller than Hart's. The print on the flashlight did not match Jean's fingerprints. The hair discovered on the duct tape 
did not correspond to hearts. Swabs taken from the victims yielded inconclusive results. Contrary to initial suggestions, Jean was right-handed, not ambidextrous. Following six hours of deliberation, the jury rendered a verdict of not guilty. Despite the acquittal, Jean still faced a daunting 300-plus years of imprisonment. Tragically, he barely served a fraction of his sentence. Two months post-trial, while exercising in the prison yard, Jean suffered a fatal heart attack, succumbing at the age of 35. The murder remains unsolved. If the perpetrator isn't Hart, then who is responsible for the heinous crime? In the introductory section of this article, I mentioned a note discovered a couple of months prior to the murders. Could the author be the actual culprit? Police are skeptical, primarily because, in addition to the menacing threat, the note included references to Martians. Regardless, even after the murders, this note was not treated with seriousness. Law enforcement initially considered several dozen suspects. While initial DNA testing in the 1990s ruled out some, Hart remained unresolved. However, the release of more comprehensive DNA testing results in May 2022 strongly pointed towards Gene with a high degree of probability, as affirmed by Andrea Fielding, the Director of Forensic Services for the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. Denise's mother, Betty, harbored an unwavering belief in Hart's guilt from the moment she encountered him in court. She has visited her daughter's grave only once, choosing to preserve memories of Denise as if she were still alive. Betty perceives glimpses of Denise in one of her granddaughters, Morgan. On the other hand, Lori's mother, Sherry, expressed in an interview that she has managed to cope with her daughter's tragic death. However, she still harbors hope that the true perpetrator, whoever it may be, will eventually face justice. She maintains doubts about Hart's involvement. Carla, the counselor who discovered the bodies, later pursued a career as a police officer. Admitting she has never met the girl's parents, she confesses to an ongoing sense of guilt, fearing to look them in the eye. Carla has struggled with sleep since 1977, haunted by the memories of that night. I haven't had a single good night's sleep since 1977. I wake up every night and remember those sounds. And then what I saw in the morning reveals Carla Wilhite. I don't know who did it, but I hope he gets his due. I hope you like this story. Please don't forget to leave a comment sharing with your thoughts below. Give a thumbs up this video and remember to hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more captivating stories. Thank you for joining us on this remarkable journey and we'll see you in the next video.